Well, the first to come were students who came in the 1890s, and they were seeking Western technology and, and uh, ideas and knowledge in order to strengthen imperial rule. Uh, but uh, actually, they were soon followed by a huge number of workers who are looking for economic opportunity. And so the first went to Hawaii, but then by the 1900s, more were coming to the continental United States. Uh, we're talking, well, it's easier to kind of go work uh, backward, but by, uh, by, by the eve of World War II, there were about 120,000 Japanese Americans, uh, two-thirds of whom were American-born and on, in the continental United States, and about 150,000 in Hawaii, yeah, who were, in fact, incarcerated. And then there were several thousand in the East Coast who were not. Issei means literally first generation, and it refers to the Japanese immigrants. Nisei literally means second generation, and it refers to the U.S. citizen, American-born uh, children of the Issei. That is Sansei, that is third generation, and I am, in fact, one of the third generation. That's My true. mother's father came um, over 100 years ago, um, and there are different family stories about why he came, possibly seeking, uh, seeking to escape conscription into the Imperial Army, maybe, uh, but certainly seeking economic opportunity uh, as coming from a rather poor rural family. And um, on my, uh, and uh, he went back when he was about, tw he was a teenager at the time, and he went back when he was about 21. Um, uh, no, I take that back. I'm sorry, I'm messing up my own history. He went back considerably later when he had earned enough money to bring back a wife. So my grandmother was much younger. My other, my father's parents were both teenagers from a small fishing area who came, I think, when they were about 15 and 17. They came in the 19, late 19 teens. Uh, the um, Japanese immigrants were able to become citizens in 1952 with the McCarran-Walter Act being passed. And I believe that um, one set of grandparents chose to, and one set of grandparents never got around to it. My parents were both born in 1926, and uh, my father's uh, family lived in Orange County. And, but he actually was born in Gresham, Oregon where my grandfather had done a range of things. He had worked as a hops picker. He worked, um, he was a lumberjack for a while, and he did a, a waiter. He did many things. They ended up farming in Southern California. And um, so uh, my, mother's, my mother was uh, born in uh, Northern California, in uh, Oakland. My mother's family was first uh, incarcerated in uh, the Tanfran Assembly Center, and then they were sent to the Topaz Camp in Utah. My father's family was sent to the Santa Anita Assembly Center, and they ended up in the largest of the camps, which was the Poston Camp in Arizona. And as luck would have it, both of, both of those assembly centers began as racetracks. So in both camps, people were living in horse stalls that had been only just recently vacated by the horses. My father did not talk about it. Uh, but my mother has told me many stories about her experiences. The city girls are the urban Japanese American second generation who got to have all the fun that my poor rural parents did not get to have um, because they grew up having to work from dawn till dusk. And the city girls are the second generation Nisei girls and young women who grew up in Southern California who were able to participate in a wide range of extensive youth clubs, uh, many of them sponsored by churches, uh, the YMCA, YWCA, um, Girl Scouts, uh, USA, and um, a host of other organizations. That generation. is the first generation, the, the immigrants, because of uh, the United States birthright citizenship, their children, the second generation, were American citizens by birth. And so it was they who had, were able to gain title to, for example, land. Um, they, and they were the ones who were able to vote and to participate politically.
Absolutely. So, yes, these are, um, as you can see from the cover, this particular group are the Tartanets. They were a group that was founded um, um, under the auspices of the Union Church, and they were affiliated with the YWCA. Um, they had lots of parties and dances. They were very good dancers, and um, they were also very active in social service and community organizing. Well, if we're talking about the Nisei clubs in general, I think it's important to think about why they formed. And the 1920s and 30s were actually quite a difficult period. Uh, there was a great deal of racial exclusion, if we think just about uh, residential segregation. And uh, certainly for young people, they weren't always welcome in extracurricular activities and organizations. This varied from school to school and district to district in terms of the level of, of acceptance or exclusion. But I think that fact that by 1940, there were something like 400 Nisei youth clubs, uh, gives testimony to the kind of difficulties they faced in gaining acceptance in the larger society and also that they weren't always welcome um, in other high school or, or post high school organizations. I think the clubs have been tremendously important. I'd also like to just mention that these clubs were not just a Southern California phenomenon, but that there were Nisei youth clubs that were very active all the way from Seattle uh, and San Francisco, Sacramento, Los Angeles, and down to San Diego. And there were probably others inland that I'm not so familiar with. Um, but these clubs, I think, have been uh, tremendously important. Uh, many scholars have wondered why it was that the Japanese American community was able to rebuild relatively steadily after their incarceration during World War II. And I think that, um, of course, this is glossing over a lot of the hardships that they experienced. It wasn't easy, but I think it's really important to think about the underpinnings, which were this vast array of youth clubs and uh, that helped train youngsters and gaining all kinds of organizational leadership skills from the time they were in junior high school because many, many urban Nisei were in these clubs and they learned how to organize bake sales and fundraise and put together um, you know, a plan for the year uh, to uh, set goals and to reach them from a very early age. And these, um, the networks continued on for high school students, uh, for those who were either going to college or who were college age, uh, young singles and, uh, and on. And so, I think that we can see women's participation in these being particularly prominent in the pre-war period and in the same way we can see that they were very, very active in the post-war period. Uh, one of the most interesting, I'd say, manifestations is how many women became very involved in the post-war redress movement of the 1970s and 80s both on grassroots levels, mobilizing community groups, but also being involved in legislative lobbying. No, alas, my <laughs> mother wishes she were in, had been in a Nisei club, but again, she grew up in rural East Oakland, and so uh, she was doing a lot of farm work, and uh, they you know, didn't have uh, you know, the access to transportation like the, the, the city girls that I write about, so she was not able to do those things. That's, Yes, there are um, certainly the younger groups that formed, let's say, during the war and after the war. Those who are still in their 70s, are uh, many of them do get together. There was a group called the Jugs, which stands for Just Us Girls, that formed in the Manzanar camp for sports and dancing, and they still get together. They became an East LA group after the war, and they meet regularly to play poker, and they go together to Las Vegas uh, once a year. Oh, these, I think the clubs are very important, and I think their importance continues over uh, in the pre-war period. Not only were there sort of um, limitations on their acceptance in the larger society, but they had very strict immigrant parents who frowned upon things like dating and, and possibly dan couples dancing. So uh, the way to get parent approval for the activities they wanted to try was to join a club, often under church auspices, with advisors and chaperones. And so then the boys also formed clubs. And so this enabled the Nisei to experiment, to, to um, gain social experience, to, um, to enjoy all kinds of things, and including um, going out and, and uh, 
uh, going to places that their parents were not so familiar with, like say museums and libraries. So there were a range of activities that the clubs opened up for them. Uh, this also included, however, uh, opportunities to study Japanese culture and language as well as Western etiquette and cooking. So they really did a range of things, both affirming um, ethnic and generational ties, but also gave girls a chance to claim modern femininity and an American identity. And uh, so during the war, uh, when people were very demoralized, uh, they were in a very barren, desolate situation, and there were very few resources. Um, they were just living amid, you know, tar-papered barracks. Uh, they had nothing. They had lost everything. And uh, there, there was not only this sense of trauma, but also, for young people, a great sense of boredom. There wasn't a lot to do there. They were stuck. They felt like they had been exiled there in the middle of nowhere. And so these, uh, the older Nisei began to organize clubs for the younger. Some of the clubs from the pre-war period continued, but um, new clubs formed for the younger um, kids to give them something meaningful to do, to give them an outlet for their energies. To they had uh, the camp newspapers are filled with their uh, sports activities, their dances, um, and the things that they were trying to do to maintain morale. Um, one of the interesting clubs, I think, um, is uh, one that was founded by Yuri Kochiyama. She became later famous as an activist who was a friend of Malcolm X's. And during the war, she was um, in the Santa Anita Assembly Center, and then she was sent to the Jerome camp. And she was a s teaching Sunday school in Santa Anita, and she realized that a number of her students, her pupils, had brothers who were serving in the military. And uh, she wanted to participate in the war effort, but she also wanted to give girls something meaningful to do. And so she started a club called the Crusaders. And the Crusaders became immensely popular. What they did was they were, um, they were writing cheering letters for Nisei servicemen, sending them first to the brothers and the relatives and friends of her students. And more and more girls joined the club because they too wanted to help out. And uh, they were sending letters, letters, penny postcards to thousands of servicemen. Uh, Yuri Kochiyama herself, I think, wrote to 15,000 Nisei soldiers just by herself. Uh, and the Nisei servicemen were very enthusiastic and appreciative and began to send them a little money to help them out so that eventually they were able to send uh, real letters and two cent envelopes. Uh, yes, uh, many, uh, yes, the, all the Japanese Americans who lived um, in the western coastal states and the southern third of Arizona were all incarcerated and during the war there was a, um, men were in fact recruited and then drafted from the camps so there are many many ironies in this situation and there were many brave men who both brave men who agreed to go and there were brave men who also resisted so it's it's a very very interesting and it was a complex and tense situation I would say that it's very interesting to think about the, tra the trajectory of Japanese American history and the position of the different generations. And I think that um, we can see from the foundation laid by the first and second generations that this has given a springboard for the third generation and fourth generation to become active in society in different ways. And, and I think that. Um, uh, we can particularly see this in the outgrowth of the Japanese American third generation who became involved in the Asian American movement during the 1960s and 70s. So of course that was a period of great social ferment and uh, I think most people know about the civil rights movement and black power and maybe La Raza movement or, or the American Indian movement. People are not always as well, you know, uh, as familiar with the Asian American movement and yet it was very, also very robust and grew out of the same impetus. Uh, they were very, very much inspired by um, black power and leaders like Malcolm X. And, uh, but I have to say that I, looking at their organizational structure and, um, and the way they did things, the way they were very oriented to helping local community needs and uh, taking on local community issues that uh, in some ways they really followed the pattern of the pre-war uh, organizing of their parents.
even though some of their parents were sort of horrified at the militancy of their children. I think uh, it is partly because of their own uh, organizational ability and, um, and commitment to community that we can see that outgrowth. And I would say that the fact that their children were able to uh, become so active and to also to both generations being very active in the redress movement, the movement for Japanese American redress and reparations from the war, which resulted in the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, I think is, is does indeed, um, you know, uh, stem from, we can see the seeds of these this in the earlier activities. Well, I was giving a talk to a group of Japanese Americans in San Francisco who had all, who were all city youth, and uh, they had asked me about my first book, which is about a farm community, and I was talking about how hard it was for adolescents growing up in the, in the Central Valley, and I asked them about their lives, and they started telling me about the parties, the dances, the social life, the pen pal clubs, the love lorn advice columns, and a whole world that I had not known about opened up before me, and I thought, I have to find out about this. So that was the beginning for me of looking into the life of the urban Nisei. And they had a very good time. I teach Asian American history. I teach US 20th century history. Um, I am uh, co-teaching a freshman cluster class with several scholars from other departments on interracial d dynamics. And presently, I'm teaching a class on Asian American history through foodways. It is a very uh, introductory class. I teach, um, uh, we start with, um, uh, immigration to Hawaii, and we talk about, uh, you know, uh, and I also talk, we, we sort of do a two coast start, one starting from immigration to Hawaii, and then also Chinese coming to the U.S. West because of the gold rush, right, which drew many people from around the world. And, um, and I might add, there were Chinese restaurants in San Francisco from the gold rush period on. Chinese have, restaurants have been popular since at least 19, 1850. And, uh, and there was a very rich history um, going from the early immigration to post-65 immigration, which brings a whole new influx of people from other parts of Asia.